So today we have a uh, Mete Foged that who will present integrating refugees, language training, or workforce incentive. So as for the rule, the seminar is recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please uh, switch off the video. If you have any questions, you can uh, use the functionality raise your hand or use the, um, the chat. And please uh, wait for either me or Mete to um, allow you to speak. So uh, the floor is yours and you have uh, one hour, Mete. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for joining. I'm, I'm very excited to present this paper um, to this uh, competent and specialized crowd here at CREAM. Uh, I was at CREAM, it's now eight years ago. I just looked at doing early in my PhDs. Um, it was a great time and um, it's great to be back, even though it's virtual this time. Um, yes, as already said, I'm presenting a paper on integration of refugees. Uh, it's joint work uh, with um, Jacob, who I believe is also uh, present, uh, Eben Balvi, uh, Linnea, who is also present, and Giovanni Piri. Um, and uh, we are looking at a reform in Denmark in 1999. The main purpose of this reform was to expand and increase the, the quality of the language training uh, that refugees receive. Um, however, the reform also lowered benefits for a subgroup of these people. So I'm basically going to speak about what we could call um, work first incentives or uh, training um, skill first policies. So the, the fundamental question I would like to discuss is uh, do refugees lack incentives to work or do they lack skills uh, early on in the, in the time in the, the new, their host country? Okay, and we are going to look at both economic and social outcomes. Um, we are not the first to do this uh, and not the first to look at these two types of policies. I'll get back to the, the literature. Let me first um, motivate this a little bit. Um, I guess all of you have seen uh, graphs like this. So here we just reproduced uh, graphs you will find in um, a lot of papers out there. On, uh, we reproduced it for our sample and um, natives and low-skilled natives in the same age range. Um, so this is just uh, confirming what we already know, that there is a large employment and earnings gap between refugees and um, natives. Um, the, so I list here recent uh, overview that is uh, extremely useful to and has a lot of um, references on, on these uh, gaps across countries. And also Maria Schulz Nielsen from Denmark has, is probably the person who's worked the most on describing this uh, persistent gap um, between refugees and, and the natives in Denmark. Okay. Clearly, some of these uh, differences uh, could reflect differences in institutions and policies, and any policy that can improve this uh, labor market integration will have uh, large returns to the refugees and uh, to the host countries. So, uh, to convince yourself of that, just, we can just look at some of the papers that have been written about the fiscal benefits and generally um, the that generally shows that there is uh, in most countries a, a cost uh, due to the lower employment and the uh, earnings of these uh, non-economic migrants. Okay. Um, 
people have worked on uh, policies that is sort of before what the period we are looking at. So before uh, refugees have obtained asylum in the host country. So policy concerning reception and early time in the host countries, such as employment bans, waiting times. Um, it, so the lists here on this slide are not exhaustive list, but some indication of, of the, the important and on, on other Danish papers on the topic. Um, more related to ours is those that have to do with policies that directly uh, target integration of refugees once they have settled in the host country. So that could be employment support, so more um, regular uh, active labor market programs, evaluation of those. Um, provision of incentives and teaching of relevant skills. Let me be a bit more specific. Um, here is uh, what we think are probably the most related papers to what we are looking at. So as I already said, the, the main purpose of this was for reform was um, to improve the, lang the language of, of refugees, newly arrived refugees and family unified to refugees. I want to say that uh, everything is about both the refugees and family unified uh, to existing refugees. I, I'll often just call them refugees, but both are in our sample. Um, yeah. Okay, so there is a large literature documenting a strong and positive association between uh, language proficiency or skills and um, labor market performance of immigrants. Um, and there are now a few papers looking specifically at language training. So one thing is that um, how much of the association is caused or not. Another thing is um, whether it's productive to teach uh, refugees um, to, yeah, to have refugees attend language classes or whether they could as well learn it in the labor market. So for this reason, I, I think it's important to look specifically on where the language training is uh, productive. So there is a paper from Finland, the first one here. It uh, also considers uh, long run uh, outcomes and find relative large effects on earnings of a change in the service profession. Um, so basically uh, they evaluate uh, an, a reform that introduced integration plans in Finland. The authors show that what the reform did was changing the composition of the service provided towards more language training and less regular active labor market policy. So this is also a paper that speaks about the effectiveness of giving language training to refugees. Uh, another paper that does that is um, from France. Here the setting is quite different from what we know in Scandinavia because uh, a share of the uh, migrants know the language very well or well know it before arriving. So here the design is they have an initial test um, and based on the performance of that test, uh, these immigrants are assigned to 100 additional hours of language training. Um, so another margin, they find a sizable labor force participation effect, um, nothing significant on unemployment. The reason is properly the um, time horizon. As I will also argue later, uh, language acquisition is sort of a um, gradual process. So we don't expect an immediate uh, effect in the labor market. Um, okay, so this was on the, the language and the language training. Um, 
as I already said, the, the reform also has a benefit reduction for a subgroup uh, of the refugees. Uh, they are all, there's also a small literature looking at, at this. Um, most uh, related to ours and most recent, oh, the yes, it's probably not right here on the and Anderson, Dustman and Landersway paper. Um, so they look at, uh, what I would say, short, medium run effects of uh, the next benefit reduction in Denmark. So the one we had was in 1999 and uh, was removed after one year. So they look at the reintroduction in 2002 um, and find uh, effects on um, the labor market performance, but my reading is uh, that these effects dies out within seven, eight, six, seven, eight years. Um, so short, medium run effects on the labor market. And they also find uh, that uh, these uh, immigrants are more likely to commit uh, property crime, specifically shoplifting. Um, when, uh, as a consequence of this lower uh, benefit. Um, and they look at the next generation. Okay. So our contribution, uh, um, so we, we basically would like to know which policy between work first incentives and skill first is most effective in improving economic and social outcomes of refugees. Uh, we believe we bring a credible, credible approach to study this. So uh, similar to uh, uh, actually the, the Finnish paper and the um, Anderson, Dustman, and Landerser paper, we use a discontinuity based on the date of uh, receiving uh, asylum in the host country. Um, we look at short and long run, uh, the short and long run causal impact of this reform. So primarily an expansion of mandatory la language training, but also the additional effect of reduced benefits to a subgroup. We also estimate the impact on the next generation and um, shed some light on the likely channels and the dynamics and the magnitude of these effects. Um, yeah. Any questions so far? Yeah, can I just ask something? So, yes. um, if I understand you right, you basically have, have two reforms here at the same time. Yeah. First of all, language training. If you go back to your previous slide. And then secondly, um, you, have, you have a reduction in benefits. Yes. So you cannot distinguish between the effects of one versus the other. Is that the way I see this slide? Yes, I, I guess you're right. So it's, it's difficult here because Yes, the, we have a combined treatment for, for a subgroup. So we cannot separate them, if, if that's what you mean? Yes. Yes, I, I, I guess you're right on that. Uh, so how do, I, how do I think about uh, the estimates then? Um, so so this, it is extremely, so this has no, ex, it, it doesn't have external validity, right? because it is very, very specific to this particular combination of uh, policy interventions. Is that the way to think about that? Which could work in opposite directions or which could support each other? We, we don't really know. For, I guess for the labor market, I think for some of the results I'm going to show you, it's really clear what is operating. So similar to your paper, we find that this benefit reduction. And I think quite interestingly here, the benefit reduction is very short, one year. 
and we see the shoplifting starts and goes away exactly when the benefits are back to normal. So patterns like that, maybe we discuss again when we see results. I think the patterns we show, some of them are clearly consistent with only the benefit story and some are consistent that with the... Have, that, that is, we have done already. So um, this relation between uh, reduction in benefits and shoplifting, that's in our paper. Yeah, so, so that you so can say we confirm your reason? finding on that. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, can, I, can, I, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Um, um, so the, the 99 reformers, I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's also the, uh, the thing that, uh, that you have to then stay where you're assigned to as a refugee. So yeah, they do I, stay longer. Yeah, so I, you, I, I'll yeah. get back to that point. Yeah. And, and that's also part of the reform and, and the, I guess your treatment effect. That, that there's no mobility towards the larger cities. Uh, to get away. It takes a little longer. Yeah. So what we see is they both groups move, but the, those before move earlier. So we have studied the mobility pattern quite in detail, and maybe I'll we can uh, discuss that more uh, when we get to this. Um, but you are you are absolutely right. There is some uh, differences in in how long they stay. I and. I would say this is partly the treatment also. So they are exposed to a longer program during which they, ha they have to stay. And they, they do stay. Okay, let me describe the, the, the reform and maybe preview what we find first. Yeah. Um, so, as I already stated, uh, we think our findings are consistent with gradual language acquisition and inconsistent with effective work first incentives. And I'll explain more later. Um, this has to do with the pattern in the effects we estimate. Um, we find permanent and large post language training program effects on employment. So, and earnings. So employment increased by uh, a magnitude similar to, to 22% of, of the baseline and earnings increased by uh, 34% uh, in comparison to the baseline. Uh, we see no immediate uh, income and earnings effects. And combining this with studying this su subgroup, we conclude that uh, they, there isn't evidence in this uh, that, it, that are consistent with um, if effective, the effectiveness of reducing these benefits. Um, we find higher crime rates, but only for the duration of the temporary reduction in benefits and only for those affected by this benefit reduction. Um, we find that uh, the immigrants that uh, are exposed to this more intensive and longer uh, language training, they get additional education. They obtain a, a additional education in Denmark, and they also work in more communication intensive jobs. The latter is not significant, though. Um, we have done a lot to try to see if there's any fertility effects or any patterns in who they marry. We find nothing there. Um, and also over time, so it's true that in the beginning, there are differences in mobility rate. Over time, it's the same share who has left their initial municipality and um, we would say generally the, the mobility effects and, and uh, sort of cancels out over time. Uh, the boys of treated parents seem to do better in school and are less likely to commit c 
crime, we find nothing on girls. Um, okay. So the main ingredients of the reform was a substantial expansion of this language training. So there was already a quite um, extensive language course in Denmark at this time. So this is not about going from, from zero to some language training. This is about expanding uh, an already existing uh, language training. So they expanded it with more than uh, 400 hours and increased the maximum duration, uh, actually doubled it. So increased it from uh, 1.5 to three years. Um, it could be longer, so you, it's, this period is paused if you have maternity leave or sick leave, things like that. But um, basically three years. Um, the municipalities are um, reimbursed um, for these additional hours. And there was a lot of uh, things going on to, to increase the quality. So they introduced national tests. Uh, there were means allocated to increase the qualification of the teachers. Um, yeah, and there were was also a small course in civic understanding. This is 20 hours and um, we, I, I think we think that this is probably not that important compared to the large exposure to language training. But in theory, that's uh, in there as well. Uh, on the next slide, I'll refer to this combination of civic course and language training together as integration services. Okay, um, at the same exact threshold in date of um, admission, they lowered welfare benefits for refugees aged 25 or with children. Um, the reduction was substantial, but smaller than the reintroduction in 2002. So that could be another reason we don't, uh, See, um, see any labor market effects uh, or additional effect uh, for this subgroup. So the reduction uh, in our setting was 25-29%, uh, whereas it's more like 50% in the later reform. Also, it was temporary. It was precisely 13 months, starting from January 1st, 99. Um, I'll speak more on the, about the reform in the next slides. So here you just, you first see from uh, admin data from the municipalities. So this is basically uh, showing what the municipality register about activities that these people attend. There is a big jump as in the share assigned to uh, language training from the municipalities. The reason for this big jump is more of an administrative one because uh, the municipalities also had the responsibility of registering this from 1st of January 99. Um, so I'll, I'll show more on, on, um, on the next slide on the actual language thing. So here it shows that the municipalities do respond and do give uh, uh, provide this language training to almost everyone. So the reason for not participating could be uh, you're too ill, you uh, small kids, um, or yeah, that should be the main reason because it's basically a mandatory program. Um, and there's a big uh, shift in hours. More interestingly is probably this one, because that's more true uh, on the actual language training they get, because this is data from the language training facilities. Uh, and so the bullet, the, the point estimate at the top is the one you should compare with the previous, which is basically just the 
how the municipalities register it, and they have the re responsibility after this reform to re register this for, for their citizens. But as we see from this data, uh, the share receiving language training was unchanged. It's very high and com exactly the same uh, before and after the reform. So again, it's not about receiving it or not. The change is many more hours. Um, so we see that hours here increase on average by um, little, something less than 300. So less than the reform mandated on average. We also have a little higher absence um, among the treated. They enroll longer and there's more days between the first start day we observe and the last uh, end date. So they could have breaks in this language training. Okay. Yeah, so this was basically to convince you that there is a lot going on, a big expansion of this language training. Um, then a bit more on, on what else happened and how it was implemented. So, um, participation in the new program was determined by the date of admission. So, those that received residency before January 1st, 99 are under the old rules. So, they are eligible for less hours and resident, uh, those that receive um, residency or more, or rather refugee status, uh, January 1st, 99 or later are under the new rules. Uh, so we'll use a regression discontinuity design. Um, most refugees knew nothing about the reform when applying. So this act was proposed uh, in the spring, three quarters of a year earlier and passed uh, in in the summer and and the average waiting time uh, at this time was more than a year um, also it's uh, interesting to note that it takes time so the discontinuity is January 1st but these people on average settled in the municipalities two months later. Um, so that means the structure change I already mentioned about now the, from January 1st, municipalities are basically responsible for managing the language training facilities and registering citizens, their citizens for these courses. So I think this one is it's minor and it's not aligned with the um, discontinuity. This happened from January 1st and in all municipalities and they start receiving the cutoff. These people, they start receiving their, they are on average two months later. Um, yes, and, and then, yes. Let's, let's get back to these things. Uh, Later, I'm happy to discuss more. Um, we study these, I think we studied all these in, in detail. I have more evidence also on how long they then, they stayed when we get to the results. Okay. Um, of course, as any R, RD study, we would like to know whether there were some it, whether there was some scope for mani manipulating um, the date of admission. It, it's clearly, it shouldn't be possible from the re refugees or the municipalities. One could think maybe for some reason, uh, the case workers processing these cases would have refugees some yeah, on one side of this threshold. So what I show, you know, what we show here is first just the density of monthly admissions. So it's quite volatile over the year. In the in panel B, we have tried to um, demean the monthly share. So 
that means does December, December stick out compared to the other Decembers? All right? So basically the month ar around the, or close to our threshold is quite on average. Um, yeah. Of course, we could still vary there is some shorting, sorting across the threshold. So this is what we address in the next uh, slide. Here we have put um, all, all the characteristics uh, we could think of for these newly arrived. Um, we have their age and the gender. We have detailed information that is not that uh, common from the from the the early language training registers in Denmark we can actually see what language they speak um, from their home country um, here we also have Danish one two three is the Danish tracks they are assigned to so they, 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 that's a bit unusual as uh, balancing variables because it's happening after arrival uh, the reason we have it there is uh, we thought it might be some give some an indication of of their skills since we don't have the education level of refugees in the in registered data and basically the least skilled are assigned to Danish one if you don't know the Latin alphabet or have only primary schooling, you should in theory be assigned to Danish one and Danish three is more fast learner track, Danish two in between. Okay, overall we think it's very well balanced. What sticks out a little bit is, whoops, is we have used a distinction between rural and urban municipalities from the Danish Economic Council. Uh, where urban, where they seem to be more often live in urban municipalities. When we then look at the largest cities, it's completely balanced. So what to take away from this is that there's some uh, degree of urbanization and it's those closest to the threshold between urban and, and rural that is driving. It's not the large urban areas in Denmark. So we are working, we are polishing the paper right now. And one of the priorities is to implement um, a measure of urbanization from Eurostat and see how that goes. Because, um, yeah, because it's, it's it's really, it's those on the margin that are driving this. Yeah. Okay, so overall, extremely balanced, which it also should be. It's a date of receiving your um, asylum, uh, asyl approve, get your asylum application approved. Yeah. Okay, it's administered data from Denmark. Um, important here so we we have the usual stuff on labor market outcomes we added also uh, criminal charges and conviction and we track people over quite a long time horizon so over 18 years so from 1999 to 2016 uh, we supplement this with data from the language training facilities that you saw earlier, earlier where we can see how many hours they actually get. Uh, we also link all the refugees to spouses and children to look at the family structure and the next generation. Okay, the empirical specification, I think it can be brief here. <laughs> so it's very standard regression discontinuity um, using yeah, the up-to-date procedures of, of selecting the bandwidth, et cetera. I'll go to the results. Any questions that I haven't seen so far? Okay. I have one minute. Um, yes. So, uh, 
so the the obligation to uh, participate in language training so yes. how does that relate to employment so say that i'm a refugee and i find employment in year two yeah does the obligation then fall away or do i have to resume language training when i then become unemployed in year four or so if you are employed so in you only have to if you are not employed but you it's actually so that they still have an incentive um, because uh, completing these courses is tied to obtaining residency later. But you're right. So they, it's only something they have to do if they are um, unemployed. But they could continue while working. So we actually see, we study this in in some other work when they attend language training. So, and a lot of them attend also in the evenings. So if you start a job, you could uh, continue in and then take evening classes. So okay. uh, the question you had in mind is that whether to, um, how much to think about these two activities crowding each other out? Uh, yeah, so so for once, so say that 20% obtain employment within the first two years, and then the language reform had to do with the third year of language training, it's sort of the extra year in that. So then those obtaining employment within the first two years would not be affected by the reform, it, be, it would be the last three quarters. Yeah. And yeah, if okay. that then had something to do with, with the results you find and the timing and the time horizon, I'm not sure. So basically no one finds employment during the first years very few and it was unchanged by the reform um so i think the the way to understand this is that so let me these uh, graphs here i show it, we show in in the top it's everyone and in the bottom we split so that the red are those that are um, that also have the benefit reduction and the blue are those that only has have the language training um, we 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 see very little unemployment in the beginning and if we look also at earnings very little in the beginning so where the effects start to be significant is after these um, program has ended. So some of it might be that uh, a log in and some of it clearly is also if you think of language training, this is a, a, a gradual process to um, acquire language skills. So clearly this effect have to build up over time. And uh, we think this is, is what we see in this phase after the program has ended. So at that point, uh, most refugees are not uh, attending classes anymore, but we see a gradual improvement of starting uh, after the program of employment and earnings of these people. Um, the effects are extremely robust to the bandwidth. So there's almost a clear level shift around this reform in employment and earnings uh, of these people. It's rarely, um, they're rarely larger and more significant uh, estimates. So in the bottom hours uh, estimate is the red lines. Um, we also checked alternative specifications. Um, so this is, this is the pattern with respect to employment and uh, earnings. Then what also happened is that people gradually enroll, actually from early on, they start enrolling in education in Denmark at much higher rate and after like year seven, eight, we see an, on the average, we see an effect on people who have completed educations in Denmark. If we split by age, 
this is very clear. So it's, it's the young who obtain further education in Denmark. On the mobility that uh, we have talked about. Um, so it's true that the control group are much more likely to leave and they can leave earlier. Um, so the, remember the program more than doubled and the treated will have to stay for this duration. So the treated basically don't move the first three years and still in year four, four they're um, less likely to have left their initial municipality. And then it gradually becomes more or less the same. Um, we never see significant differences with respect to living in urban municipalities, but we have this little, the initial difference that I told you about in the balancing test that we can see here, uh, but less so in the large cities. Okay. Then what is interesting? So, so far, except for education, we haven't really found, and for a long time, we thought this was only about language. And we saw nothing all the time. We studied labor market outcomes. We saw nothing, uh, no differential effect across these two groups we have. Then when we added the crime, uh, there was an interesting pattern uh, popping up. So this is what we have summarized here. So I, all crimes is basically showing the same. This is all crimes, but almost all of it is shoplifting. Um, so interesting here is that the benefit reduction was only 13 months. And what you see here that they only uh, committed these uh, crimes during this first year, and then it goes back to zero. Um, so basically this type of crime is rare in the control group, and it's also rare in the treatment group after one year. So from year two, three onwards. So it's really, um, I think giving additional evidence of what uh, Rasmus and Christian uh, and Lars has shown that uh, it is this benefit reduction that is uh, pushing people into simple shoplifting. And once they have a higher income level, it goes away. In the bottom, you see that it is entirely driven by those, so the red, so those that uh, experience the reduction. Um, but Mede, do you show the actual income reduction uh, then in year one? So how large was that? Uh, we looked at it at some point, but it's it's around uh, 28, 29 percent. Also administered in, in that way or? Is there some with additional payments or? Yeah, so that is also what comes. So there is, so municipalities, so it's it's the case in there, if you fall uh, below a sort of a minimum in a low, have a very low income, it's possible case by case for case workers to give you additional, um, so for instance, assistance, for public transport, assistance for paying your rent. And there, there's also some evidence that this lowering of welfare benefits, um, I th so this is something we, we cannot really see ourselves in the data, but something there, there are reports from that time that this was happening, that so that the refugees were to some extent compensated um, by other, so help with uh, rent and such kind of uh, 
of uh, economic assistance. Yeah, so that's uh, and um, the benefit reduction was also smaller than the later one. But still we see this um, effect on shoplifting. So you could say the cash on hand still decrease even if they get um, assistance to buy, for instance, their public transport uh, card. Did it answer your question? Yes, so, so, I, so I think the short version is just that it would be nice to see a, a similar graph for the income ah. as well in year one, because that's, I guess, the explanation. Yeah, that's, yeah we have, that's, uh, I'll find that. Yes, thanks. Yes, because what we have here in the slides is only the labor market earnings, so that doesn't answer what you add. Thank you. Okay, 10 minutes left. Let me be brief here. Um, so the challenge when studying the second generation with such a reform is to um, define when children are treated. Because a lot of, re of refugee families, actually uh, the majority of them don't arrive together. Most often it's the father and then followed by the mother. That means that uh, if you define, remember the date of admission, define it by the first parent, that would typically be the father. So that's very similar to define treatment by the arrival of the father. Or if you, and those two corresponds to defining treatment as having both parents treated because then the mother will be later and, or, and also treated. If you define treatment as the last parent or the mother, then that will typically mean that there's one treated. Okay, we think the main uh, specification to look at is those where both are treated. Um, in those, it, we see that the um, Sons of these uh, treated refugees are more likely to take exams at the end of um, the lower secondary, so the end of the Danish primary school, um, and less likely to uh, engage in criminal activities. We find absolutely nothing for girls. The sample means are also lower here, uh, for crime and higher for um, the performance in school. Um, they, they seem less sensitive um, to this. Okay. I can go show the table here. So, specification one is the first parent. Specification two is the father. So, admission of the father. And specification three is the last parent and fourth, the mother. So across all of them, we see effects on schooling. With both parents treated, we see a significant reduction uh, and quite large in crime of these boys. No matter what we do with the data, there's just nothing on the girls. Um, I, and this is consistent with this literature uh, now growing it's showing that uh, boys seem to be more vulnerable to growing up in very disadvantaged um, circumstances. Okay. Any questions? So what we have left now is a cost benefit analysis. I almost feel I should give the word to Jacob. Where is, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. So you have also been uh, crucial to to this uh, producing sure. this. Yeah. Yeah. So please interrupt. Should we yeah, do it this way? Yeah. Sure. Um. So, of course, this uh, large expansion of uh, of language training was uh, expensive. So we thought it would be interesting to. Say, okay, how much or when does this investment break even? So the, 
think of this cost benefit analysis as mainly being uh, the additional cost of this expansion of language training uh, compared to the um, additional earnings among these refugees. We show that uh, in the baseline, we do hear uh, this reform breaks even already after five years. Um, and varying all the assumption, it looks like in all cases, this reform is very likely to have a positive impact on the fiscal budget and um, on the society. Um, yes, I think that is what I wanted to say. Do you want to uh, add something here, Jakob? No, it's fine. Uh, yeah. We can see if there's questions. Yes. On. So I think maybe now we should open uh, the floor the last five minutes. Um, I can briefly summarize, unless there are already questions. So to summarize, the pattern we find that there is just nothing going on with employment and earnings uh, immediately after arrival is consistent with a story where it's not lack of incentive. So we don't push people into job by taking their benefits early on. But the fact that this effect gradually comes later is consistent with a story where improving their skills sort of open the doors for them to the labor market. Um, on crime, on the other hand, the only story consistent with that pattern is that this benefit reduction uh, pushed people into um, committing shoplifting. Yes. I think that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening and for the comments, everyone. Um, are there any other last questions? We still have a few minutes. I have a brief question. Um, so uh, when you were explaining the uh, the reform, you mentioned that as well as the duration of the language training, also the quality of this was, yeah. I mean, there was better teacher quality. I mean, I forget the details. Yeah. Uh, is there any way you could investigate, separate out these two effects, but like conditioning on the number of hours that uh, uh, each people, I mean. I think that would be really possible? hard. I can tell you what we have done and maybe you can add. Um, so actually early on, we were quite skeptical about whether they would in fact have higher quality, have a different uh, language training compared to the control group, because we thought, okay, how would, how would um, the teaching facilities administer this? But we do see that they are not in the same classes. Um, right. Yeah, so that is a strong indication that they do receive different treatment. Uh, and then we see that it's more hours, um, but I think it's... Can I add something that... Uh, yeah? Because it's taking place at the same time, it's probably... Uh, there's probably a lot of uh, overlap between the teachers, so I think the quality dimension is not really that important, but the... I see. The, the, finance, the reimbursement of the courses is strongly linked to whether you are under the new old rules, so, so that should... Yeah, so therefore it's probably mainly the duration of the, the, the course. I see, cool, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Any other questions? If not, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, seminar. Thank you very much for joining.